Hello. Hello, Manuel. I'm Ana Maria. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, okay, I'm, uh, uh, I'm the chair, you know, I don't know how many person inside this panel, but no problem for me. Um, I have only problem that I have a screen, uh, just a small screen, so I, I don't know if uh, I can see if uh, somebody can uh, have the, yeah. the, the hands for a question, so please, mm -hmm. uh, if you can help me. Uh, mm -hmm. eventually, but if somebody use the chat, no chat, no problem. And uh, please, uh, uh, do you think that uh, everybody can mute uh, the mi microphone or uh, may I um, ask it to the person to mute the mi microphone? I, we can do it the way that if they enter, it's automatically muted. Okay, so no problem for me to, to inform for this. Yes. And is it correct for 20 minutes for each and after one after the other is the five minutes for question, right? I don't know about that actually, but sounds because good. Because there are only two persons, so I suppose it's for one hour is 20 minutes for each and five minutes for the questions and some minutes for me to introduce uh, one and the other. So, and uh, mm, we need to, um, to go to the general link uh, for the symposium. So please at the end, uh, please put the link uh, because uh, the other days the problem was that the people <laughs> didn't know how to <laughs> get yes. in. So I can do that for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, it's fine. Um, but from like, they come in and they are muted, and, but they can, if they want to, they can unmute themselves. Is that fine? So, yes, it, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, because uh, I, I start and then uh, I, I, I ask it to the first uh, uh, person, uh, professor to, to, to speak. And uh, maybe you you could uh, open the, the microphone, but I don't know if people want to <laughs> open by uh, him him or herself. That's no problem. Yes, yes, I can help if you can. I just. Uh, adjust my my screen because sure. uh, I, I must to read to another screen mm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I cannot <laughs> make two things in the same uh, in the same screen so uh, I, I read the, in the other part so yes. this is the, right <laughs> I don't know but no problem <laughs> So uh, a, a question. Um, unfortunately, yesterday I was in train, so uh, the connection was not good, and uh, uh, Professor Ishiguro was uh, my preferred talk, and unfortunately I hadn't the right the uh, a good connection. So um, do you think we could have uh, the trans? and not for publication for everywhere sorry it just was bad connection right now oh, okay i think now it's better again sorry the first okay uh just for uh for asking if uh, we we can have the the, the transcription of uh, the hmm. um uh, of the recorder i don't know because uh, many people ask me about that. Uh, I, I know that there is a copyright, but uh, maybe for academic pupils, uh, we can have it. Uh, yes, for we the will... people recorded to the session. Yeah. We will send it anyways to um, Theo, Theo Arnulf. We will, we will record the whole session and we will send it then to Theo Arnulf. And so I think uh, I could ask him. Okay. 
Okay, can you uh, send me the address? I can uh, sure. I can uh, send uh, an email, yes. or uh, if you tell me the the name, I can. Uh, uh, the name is not uh, new for me. Is uh, Theo? Yes, exactly. Okay. I sent just sent you the the address, yeah. the mail. Yes, I write because after the the connection so is okay So we have uh, some uh, minutes. Uh, do you prefer to to test uh, the microphone of the of the uh, of the person who who must speak or not? Um, if they would be ready, yes, that would be a good idea, I think. Uh, but but I cannot see. I cannot hear yeah, anything. Sorry. It was just um, one sitting ah, next okay. to me. Maybe that was confusing. <laughs> no, no, I thought it was uh, online. So. Ah, no, 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 it wasn't like in my room where I am. Um, so for me, this is the last online conference. From the next uh, week, I have uh, a conference uh, about uh, virtual stage in uh, uh, in presence, and uh, I'm so happy to do that uh, for a lot of uh, motivation. <laughs> really. cool.
Uh, Anna, it's Peter oh. Eckersall here. Hello. Hello. Um, apparently, I've been moved to your panel. Um, yes, it's correct? my panel. Okay. But uh, you are <laughs> the the. So main... I'm in the right. I'm in the right place now. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, every time in this free in these three days, uh, I wonder if uh, I was in the, <laughs> the yeah. right space. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> in I'm, general, I. <laughs> I yes. wonder this, but especially yeah. during these days, because too much links, uh, difference. Uh, mm -hmm. So I asked to Manuel to put the the link at the uh, at the end of the of this talk uh, to remind uh, to remind to the main uh, link for the forum for the symposium. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, you know, I'm here now. So we start in fifteen, I guess. So. Yeah. Yes, ten, 10 minutes. Yeah. So yeah. less than 10 minutes. Yeah. Um and um who are my other co-panelists? Because we've moved um um I guess I was in panel three, but now I'm in panel two. So no, um Julie Michel Morin is uh -huh. uh, is uh, here. I saw her in the main uh, um panel but okay. uh, uh i i don't see her please manuel can you see if uh, uh, um the other uh person are in uh <laughs> not here yet okay they're not correct <laughs> okay panel. um thank you that's that's all okay. good um I guess my only question is how many people will be in the panel? How long should we speak for? Ah, okay. Uh, so uh, we have three panels. So maybe um, I saw uh, 40 persons in the main uh, um, uh, yeah. conference space. So maybe we split. <laughs> yeah, we have one hour. So we yeah. should maybe speak 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, we have or... one hour. So. Uh, yeah. Only mm. two panelists, so uh, we have uh, 20 minutes uh, about. Uh, okay, that's fine. Mm. Great. The other are free, and mm. uh, we are uh, only two because. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, Manuel, I'll, I'll be showing a um, PowerPoint, so um, I don't know if you need to make me a co host or something. But... Okay. Um, yeah. I think it shouldn't be necessary. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But let me check. No, you can, even if you're not host. Um, okay, I am interested you. in topic, but great. Okay. Um, sorry, Manuel, but it's strange because uh, uh, I'm sure that I saw her in the other panel. Okay. Yeah, I don't know more. I can see if she's in Thank the you. panel okay. three, I think, but the others I also don't know. But maybe she will come in some minutes. Just okay. We we'll wait. Test anything.
Ok. Hello, Julie. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Andrea? Yes, perfect. Okay. Direi che ci siamo. Uh, we follow the order of the list, so Julie, you are the uh, first to, 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 to talk. Okay. Hello, Isabella, and hello to everybody. We can start. Okay. So, uh, welcome to this panel entitled Robots, New Materiality and Disappearance uh, of the human. I'm Anna Maria Monteverdi from University of Milano. I'm chair of this panel and I am very happy to present our guest, uh, Julie Michel Moren, PhD candidate at the University of Montreal and Antwerp, and Peter Eckersall, professor at uh, City University of New York. You have 20 minutes each and five minutes for questions. Question can be written in chat or you can write your hand virtually. <laughs> Let's start with the first talk the materiality of robots and the why robotic methods on stage by Mrs. Julie Michelle Moren. Some biographical notes. She is a doctoral student in literature and uh, she is pursuing her doctoral research at the University of Montreal and Antwerp. Her main research interest concerns uh, robots and machines in the theater field and the way they reshape our conceptions of human and non-human interactions. She takes a multidisciplinary approach that encompasses neomaterialist theories and techno-feminism in order to analyze the work of many contemporary performances, stages, and robotics. She has been published in several academic journals, and she's also a dramaturg who collaborates with artists working at the intersection of art and sciences. I leave you the word. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be among you uh, today. And uh, I want to start by thanking the whole organization uh, team for putting together this event, especially in those complicated times. Um, thanks a lot for the artwork and uh, the past two days were absolutely fascinating. So I will only take a minute uh, just to share my screen and start my PowerPoint, if you don't mind, and then we will be good to go. Uh, is it okay? You see uh, the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, perfect. We're good to go. Uh, so before we uh, start, it's important for me to um, emphasize that uh, those are preliminary analyses uh, that will be integrated later into my, my thesis. So your comments are welcome. It's a work in progress, and I look forward to the conversation uh, that will follow. So as you can read, uh, the title of my presentation is The Materiality of Robots and Why Robotic Matters on Stage. And I will be looking at uh, two performances, uh, Uncanny Valley by Stefan Kaigi and Inferno by Louis-Philippe Demers and Bill Bourne. Uh, we'll try to underline how both show gives rise to distinct entanglements between human and robots, because rather than reinforcing the historical dualism between subject and object, I believe those performances challenge an anthropocentric standpoint that conceive a uh, matter as passive, and I also believe that those performances value the agency of robots on stage and that they shed light on the relational ontology of human and non-humans. To do so, I will use uh, Karen Barad's theory of agential realism, the underlying concept of interaction and uh, diffractive 
active analysis, which is a framework to investigate entanglements between meaning and matter. Um, Michael Blicker gave an excellent talk on the topic just uh, a few minutes ago, so I will try to be brief about those aspects, but I'll still need just to elaborate a little bit. So, um, just give me a second, I have trouble with the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, uh, so American feminist uh, physicist and theorist uh, Karen Bahad sets out the principles of agential realism in her book, Meeting the Universe Halfway. And her theory challenges the binary between subject and object, between human and non-human, and between nature and culture, because it envisioned phenomena as a performative entanglement between matter, bodies, ID, discourses, ideologies, etc. So to think about these entanglements and what they mean, Barat suggests reflecting on them not through the concept of interaction that could be defined as um, causal links, linear chronologies, and distance apart entities, but rather through the notion of interaction. Um, interaction uh, points out, um, uh, could be understood, sorry, as a rejection of causal logic in favor of a mutual constitution of entangled agency. So interaction points out to how phenomena are co-constituted by agential forces, and those agential forces are not solely human. So this interactive vision of the world accurately reflects the dynamic at work in a theatrical performance where matter, objects, affects, bodies, or sounds constitute specific worlds that are being reconfigured each night. As scholar Sarah Lucy suggests, interactivity is a way to understand the entanglements between the elements that make up the scenic performances. And I'm quoting her when I say, in other words, ideas and meaning circulate with the human and non-human actors, becoming another kind of performing object within the network of the stage. So to um, acknowledge these entanglements better, Barat suggests using diffractive reading. So, uh, when using the concept of diffraction, I feel that the following image can uh, help us grasp at our, uh, Barat's intent, intention better. Think about when two stones are thrown into the water and when the interference zone interact with each other. In doing so, the waves materialize on the liquid surface and they show the overlapping nature of multiple agencies. And I'm, I'm precisely interested in reading how the multiple agencies of theory, science, ideologies, robots, and human interact on stage, and how these interactivities can help us redefine the relationship between human and robot as an entangled one. So building upon this performative uh, concept of matter, I will now sh share my investigation of the shows with you. In each case, I investigate two specific aspects of the performance. The first aspect regarding the material influence of science theories, concept ideas, and ideologies on the materialization of robot. And the second aspect concerned the way both performances offer a relational reading of hum human and robotic ontologies. So both aspects shed uh, light on the robot-human relationship as an entanglement rather than focusing on matter as, um, as a passive entity. So Uncanny Valley, is a show uh, staged by Stefan Kaigi, where an anthropomorphic robot uh, alone on stage gave us a lecture about instability and the uncanny valley theory. It is important to underline that the android is the animatronic double of the German writer Thomas Mell. So his voice, his face, the rhythm of his gestures, the movement of his eyes and his hands are all modeled on the author's body. As the show progresses, we understand that Mel is bipolar and that after having a conversation with the cyborg Anno Park, he wondered how technological enhancement could help him deal with the instabilities caused by his medical condition. I um, argue that the robotic duplication of the author Thomas Mel could be understood through Karen Barad's concept of interaction as a mutually constitutive event produced by and producing entangled agencies. So the show presents the human and the robot uh, relationship as an interactive phenomenon because it does not stage the disappearance or replacement of humans by robots, but rather the interpenetration of human and robotic cultures. Um, if the show displays an anthropomorphic robot, it also problematizes the anthropocentric standpoint often embedded in robotics. 
and encourage us to reconceptualize the notions of familiarity, of humanness, and of uncanniness. The narrative incorporates elements of science's history throughout the show and underlines the material influence of theories on the materialization of the robot on stage. My first example uh, concerns a specific scene where the robot explains us the principles of the emission game as uh, Alan Turing conceptualized it in 1950. So his, his description of it underlines that the text depend on an anthropocentric and normative conception of so-called human characteristics. The human judges and their cultural and social biases parameterize a specific definition of the human where humanness is defined in regard of its consistency and its stability. Melodin implies that its psychological instability, meaning his manic and depressive phases, would probably not allow him to pass the Turing test. And the idea of extending himself through the robot rises from the desire to escape his condition. According to the logic of the game of imitation, his robotic duplication could ensure the authentication of his humanity. Thus, this scene underlined how the very concept of humanness is quite limited and how its circulation in the scientific and social field impact human lives and robotic design. By integrating the imitation game into the show's narrative, we see that all technology reflects the society it produces, including its power structures and prejudice. And we can also see how meanings circulate through matters as the robot on stage materialize himself through the ideas, concepts, and ideologies of science. These um, entanglements uh, between scientific and social practices are also visible uh, when Mella synthesizes Murray's uncanny valley theory. Uh, in short, because we all know uncanny uh, valley theory, but in short, the theory argues that humans register a negative response to a robot that does not fit the normative criteria of familiarity. It's important to underline that the Uncanny Valley situates the healthy person as the most familiar figure with whom a human would hypothetically register a positive response. Again, according to the logic of the Uncanny Valley, Mel do not fit as the normative human because of the mental health issue he is facing. So by stating such a concern, the show brings into play how scientific theory is itself an agential cut that creates distinction between the true and the false, between the human and the non-human, and between what would be normal or abnormal. And because Mel shifts the feeling of uncanniness from the robot to himself, he emphasizes how humans and robotics are intertwined and how scientific apparatuses plays a key role in creating distinction and dichotomies between them. By doing so, and especially by introducing the question of mental health, normality, and familiarity, the show also instructs us on the power of robotic theater and its potentiality to interact inside the broader robotic phenomenon to create non-normative alternatives where humans and robots are taught through each other and where they develop kinship through their uncanniness and their, their instability. Um, Uncanny, Valo, uh, Uncanny Valley sorry, also challenged the dualism between human and uh, robots by displaying their relational ontology. Because if the robot is uh, physically alone on stage, a scene where Mela's face is coated with silicon to create a mold that will later be used for the robot's creation, points out to the co-constitution of the robot and the human through their entanglement. Mela also expresses um, his desire to fade behind the silicon as he wants to merge himself through the robot. This scene underlines not the importance of distinguishing the copy from the original, but the mutuality of their ontological constitution. The performance is also uh, built upon various mediation of Mel, such as photographs, a short documentary on the author, pre-recorded videos of Mel himself addressing the audience, and of course, the presence of the robot who looks exactly like him. So even in his absence, the human always materialized through the technologies of the stage. These interactions between the human, the robot, and the mediatized elements come to constitute a vision of the robot and the human that articulates itself through their contagion and their cooperation, where, as Bahad writes, the primary ontological unit is not independent object with inherent boundaries and properties, but rather phenomena. 
So by extricating ourselves from an interactive and dualistic dynamic, and by considering the ontological relationality of the human and the non-human, the show raises important questions concerning what we might perceive as uncanny, weird, or different, and how those distinctions are always constructions. Um, so now I'd like to share some thoughts with you on the second uh, performance, which is Inferno. So Inferno is a um, collective, participative, and choreographic experience where members of the public were exoskeletons. Um, developed by artists Louis-Philippe de Mers and Bill Vaughan, the performance stages around 24 upper body exoskeletons, which control the participants' motion. If the movement carried out by the exoskeletons are largely pre-programmed, two other types of orchestration are at work. Artists um, operate the exoskeletons uh, live through a telematic device, and also a performer commands it within a custom exoskeleton. Uh, so dynamic lights effect and vibrant music also dictate the step of this collaborative dance. Um, I argue that the proximity between bodies and exoskeletons in the performance rework the power dynamics historically embedded in those machines, and that the, the shift creates an alternative relationship between human and exoskeletons. So my first example would uh, concern the ideologies embedded in exoskeletons and uh, the way artists challenge them to speculate more ethical al alternatives. From a um, scientific standpoint, exoskeletons are wearable robots and they are designed to enhance human, mo human mobility. These devices were first created in the military field but are now mainly used in factories to optimize workers' production. So exoskeletons were first developed to increase the capacity of production and performance of the human in wars and in the workplace, and they are mainly linked to techno-capitalism and techno-military ideology. But if the mass and born uses the fears uh, induced by those inherent ideologies embedded within these technological devices, the work itself turns away from these capitalist standards embedded in the exoskeletons. As Elizabeth Yopum suggests in her article, Becoming Cyborg, the myths and born create the creation plays on this specific robotic trope. And I'm quoting uh, Yopum when I say, to a great extent, Inferno capitalizes on human fears and fascination with machinic embodiments and explores the thrill and fear of the humanization of machines and the dehumanization or machinizations of humans. Indeed, the weight of the wearable robots and their control upon our movements confines us to our body and underlines the subjection of human physicality to technologies and their ideologies. But on the other end, applying this subjection to a spectacular context positions the experience of embodiment outside of a framework of production. And by doing so, Inferno transforms the feeling of subjection into a form of liberating bodily acuity. And I need to underline how much joyful the audience was on both occasions where I personally experienced uh, the performance in Porno. So by situating the human robot relationship outside of the capitalist military and medical standards, the show brings into question domination and resistant issues central to eye technology and scientific culture. Um, Inferno also challenged the dualism between human and robots by displaying their relational ontology. So the performance embodies Barrett's concept of relational ontology as humans and robots are not distinct and fixed, but codependent and becoming in the choreographic exercise. By placing the audience body inside the machine, Inferno embeds and embodies this ontological relationality between bodies and machines in the theatrical device. So while a sense of alienation and loss of agency may initially be felt by the spectator, Elizabeth Yopum note that the audience regain a sense of control by observing other audience members. And this remark points uh, to the ecological dimension of the show and highlights the deep entanglements at work in this uh, theatrical robotic phenomenon. And I would like to uh, conclude the presentation uh, by saying that 
robotic theater uh, is a space where ideas, concepts, and ideologies around human and robotic cultures materialize on this, the stage and those materialization matter because they shape and reshape the relation between humans and robots in an ongoing process of actualization. And by doing so, robotic theater can be a means to reflect on the ethical implication of robotic as a scientific field and act as an investigating space where critics can be made and alternatives can be drawn. So I wanna thank you for listening and I'm just going to put my reference uh, right here if you want to see it. So you have to unmute yourself, Ana Maria. Tiva audio. Yes, uh, just for uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. I saw both the uh, the performance in Italy in Rome Europa Festival. So I understand exactly what you uh, speak about. So this is time for questions. So you, we have uh, more than five minutes, uh, I think six. <laughs> so please, uh, if you have some questions. I, I think it was interesting that you mentioned also Louis Philippe, the, the mayor's work with the exoskeleton because uh, I, I saw the performance and I, I was intrigued in the idea that actually the people were passively accepting commands from the technology. It was not uh, the, the actual military you used where it amplifies your muscle strength. It was the other way around. So yeah, you're becoming part of the technology. Um, do you think that this also just makes people to cyborgs? Or is it just a, a kind of a fun act to try to be... Uh, to, to play with the thrill of technology away. I was not sure about this, this statement of Louis Philippe and Bill Warren here. I was a little um, unsure about that, if it was really serious or it was just trying to tease people's uh, fear of putting themselves into any technology as such. Yeah, I thank you for your question. Um, I feel there's like a little bit of a, a vote of these aspects in their work, uh, meaning that uh, um, the work of the uh, Louis Philippe Demers is often filled with uh, with humor and dark humor. So I think, yeah, there's there's kind of a uh, a joke around it, and also the aesthetics of the performance um, emphasize the fact that it could be a joke. You know, the show is called Inferno. Uh, it's about hell. The music is loud. There's big stroboscopic and uh, uh, light effects. So it, it kind of plays on that trope and um, and yeah, try to, to laugh about uh, it a little bit. But I also think that because we're, we're really experiencing the performance from within and we feel the weight of the exoskeletons and we're really being controlled during more than 30 minutes. So I think it's the performance trying to uh, start a conversation about what it means to be cyborg without necessarily take, uh, taking it so seriously that they feel that we are being cyborg at the moment inside of the, the performance, but it, it still raises the question, give us like a, a little, little feel of it. And um, I think it's, 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 it's a, a good performance to yeah, reflect on what it, what it means to be cyborg for everyone, you know, because there's no, there's no consensual definition uh, of it, especially not. Uh, I think it's important to have a personal definition of it. Where do we feel uh, cyborg is also a good question. And I think the show raises that question on an individual level. Just a little add on to that. Um, do you think any people out of that reason, because they are inscribing themselves into something which they can control basically, or they don't know before they, they experienced it, how dangerous it is. If there are any, any consent problems of maybe in the US, in Canada you are, maybe definitely not, I know that they're doing it there. But what was the, the cultural implications of putting yourself into a technology where you actually don't know if it's hurting or is it something, because you should in theater, uh, there's a kind of a agreement that you're not physically harmed. <laughs> by <laughs> yeah, and it, it's it's a good question because it's it's a performance that it's it's quite hard on the body. It's it's not smooth at all, and uh, it's not everybody that enjoys it 
uh, or fully trust the devices uh, during the entirety of the performance. But uh, I think, well, they, I, I experienced it twice. And the first time uh, we, need, we needed to arrive in the theater like an hour before the performance. Uh, they would uh, like, uh, we, we would meet the artist. They would explain the project. We would sign a paper uh, like <laughs> saying it's not the artist's fault, whatever, if we would get hurt, but still it's part of the conversation about safety. So uh, I think they, yeah. They, they try to create a safe space about safety uh, with the audience uh, before the performance. But uh, then I don't, I don't know if the, pe the performance em embodied this, uh, this conception of safety. I don't know if I'm correctly answering the question, but yeah. I wonder if it ever was performed in America, so that's why. <laughs> if what, sorry? Never performed, Eric, Peter? No. I didn't get it, sorry. If it never um, he no, it's, 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 it's not been performed in the United States. I know Philippe de Mer and we've often talked about trying to get the work here, but it's not been performed here, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I, understand, I understand why. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Okay, um, any other questions? No? Boris. People have raised hands. Yeah, Boris and me. I, I, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, ah, see, see. yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for I don't way. know, the first is uh, Boris. Yes, Boris. I, I am a small screen, so I can understand. <laughs> Sorry, Boris. Thank, thank you, Anna-Marie. Uh, uh, thank you for the uh, uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, uh, could you uh, give us, uh, uh, Chris asked you about the question of trust in terms of Inferno. Uh, uh, could you, uh, uh, I haven't, been present at any of these performances uh, 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 from 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 Inferno, but uh, from the photos and online, I see that the uh, the general atmosphere among performers was the, the, there is there was a lot of smiles and laugh and pleasant feelings, especially during uh, uh, the the installment of ex, uh, exoskeletons. But uh, uh, would you comment on this uncanny uh, uh, sensation? Associated with the robotic uh, exoskeleton on on performer's body, if if there, there if th this would be something that's also uh, part of your research, uh, 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 have you as 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 participant, I can say user, uh, thought about the possible malfunctions uh, of the technology, which would surely raise anxieties and also produce a certain uncanny uh, 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 sensation. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, my second question would be uh, about this paradox, paradox of uh, exoskeleton. I think that's also it was mentioned in an article by Yoko. Uh, exoskeletons who were uh, originally designed to enhance the body. Uh, in, in the case of Inferno, uh, turn into a, essentially a captive, captivating device. Uh, I haven't, as I said, participated in, 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 the, in the dance, in the, in the performance. But uh, as I understand, there is no, not much liberty of movement or the freedom of motion is in that sense limited. And uh, the uh, technology, uh, the, 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 the programming and some teleoperation, if any, I'm sorry, I don't know how, how the uh, uh, from the technological aspect, how the, the performance evolves, but uh, the, the the motion is, as I understand, subordinated uh, to the exoskeleton in this case. So these are the two questions: one about the trust and malfunctions, and the second one about the par paradox uh, uh, of the liberation with this, the cyborg technology. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding the first question on trust and malfunction, I need to say that uh, the, the fear that something would malfunction is a part of the performances. And it's something that I cannot speak for every member audience, but I did it, spoke with people who did it. And I think you feel it, you know, also in the atmosphere of the, during the performance. So the, the fear is of the malfunction is always there. And then, um, I think 
through the, uh, the progress of the show, you need to trust the exoskeletons because you're trapped in it, you're captive in it. And I think that it is essentially an uncanny feeling, but you start uh, dealing with this form of uncanniness and you start trusting uncanniness. And this is what it's- Interesting. Interesting and kind of important in this performance. And then, so, and then the first question links to the second one. I exactly. Guess, so it, okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. Thank so you, so you start from like an alienation and captivity feeling that uh, kind of transform itself in a form of uh, of liberating uh, acu uh, bodily acuity, but uh, the the question of, of fear never leaves you. So you're always in between uh, fear and trust, and it's it, it it is exactly where the conversation on technologies and uh, becoming cyborg is quite interesting. Inside of this paradox that never really leaves you during the entire performance. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay, thank you. And now Isabella. Um, do, we have, do we have enough time? Uh, we we finished, but one or two minutes or so telegraphic reply for Julie. So okay. the question okay. and the telegraphic reply, please. Okay. What do you think of the Stefan Kegi Kegi's gesture to put on stage the robot with uh, with the head uncovered, with his back uncovered. Uh, when when Mela is on the screen with the uh... no, no, on stage, the robot on stage that we can see him uh, or it uh, as a robot, and we can see also his back uncovered. Actually, in the performance, you don't see it from the back. Is that right? I think I, I've seen it, and I don't remember having him turn around or something. Yes, well, it's, possible. it's possible. Uh, for example, in Lausanne, we we could uh, uh, see see it uh, around the stage. Oh no! In 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 Germany, I saw it. Uh, there only were front seats. Okay. So we okay. we, we took, that was the idea. I thought uh, <laughs> the uncanny valley. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Where when when I I, I saw it in um, Utrecht. And um, I think like even from afar, when you're in um, in the, uh, the the audience, you you can see just a little bit of the design. But at the end of the show, uh, the the public was invited to go on stage uh, and move you know around the robot. And I think that this is quite important. Also, even if the the play is is finished at this point, it's absolutely part of the conversation and of um, of the play because uh, you know during all the show. Uh, the robot asked us frequently, you know, what, what did, why did you come here? What do you want to see? And I think that this feeling of proximity at the end of the show really confront us with this question. You know, why, and why do I want to come even closer? What, what am I uh, trying to, uh, to discover or unravel in this moment? So, uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a, it, but not a good thing, but I mean, it's interesting that the, uh, Okay. 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 Thank, you. thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So let's continue with the Professor Peter Eckersall. The title of his talk is The Big Laboratory, Okada Toshiki's Laboratory for an Ecological Theater, the Eraser Series. Some biograph biographical notes. He is a professor and the executive officer in the PhD program in theater and performance at the City University of New York. And he is a professorial fellow, uh, fellow at the University of Melbourne. He is co-editor of Okada Toshiki and the Japanese Theater, up, uh, upcoming in October uh, 2021. Uh, and other publications include uh, Machine Made Silence, the Routledge Companion to Theatre and Politics, New Media Dramaturgy and Performativity and Event in 1960s Japan. He was a co-founder, dramaturg of Not Yet, It's Difficult, recent dramaturgy includes uh, Everything Starts from a Dot, Phantom Sun, Another Drift, and I leave you the word. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria, for that introduction. Um, very kind and, and hi to everyone. And, and thank you, Julie Michelle, for your paper. Um, 
Um, I feel that I'm going to share my screen and um, uh, actually I'm going to just do something before I do that. Um, I just have to don't don't forget to also check mark uh, sound and video. Because I'm not. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't have sound today. I'm just showing video. Um, but um, hmm. where share? Oh, where is it? Hang on. There I am. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to begin this paper by making a few comments about uh, contextualizing the paper because actually I'm not talking about robots in this paper at all. Um, it was originally proposed that we would do a panel on um, uh, Japan scholars working on uh, autonomous objects, robots and puppets. And so um, in the COVID times, I'm the last standing person of that panel. So thank you for inviting me onto this panel. And I think probably in order to make sense of this, we should think about uh, the theme of the disappearance of the human because uh, in, in the panel title, because that's very much what I'm talking about today. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the playwright and director Okada Toshiki, uh, founder of the Japanese theater group Cheltfish, um, who has been working for most of the 21st century, he began his work in the late 1990s in Tokyo and has had quite a, a you know, an ongoing and, and very large career outside of Japan, uh, including in Germany and in Europe and in the United States and several other places. Um, what I'm talking about today is a series of works called the Eraser Series. And uh, these are works that were produced uh, by Okada as the writer director and the um, sculptor uh, Kaneyuchi Tepe. And this is very much a collaboration between somebody who is a playwright and a theater director and somebody who works in sculptural form. Um, this is a, a kind of equal collaboration as we'll come to see. In fact, uh, Kaneyuchi had uh, quite a significant role in working with the performers. And um, what I'm focusing on today is really the concept of the idea of being half transparent. And I'll talk more about what that means in a minute, but essentially this is a performance in which the actors were directed to be half transparent as part of the artistic process. So, um, and as you can see from this first image, the stage itself is absolutely littered with objects, um, which are sculptural forms, but everyday objects that are positioned and arranged on the stage. And some of them are inanimate objects. And one in particular, you can just see to the right of the screen, a, uh, some, a red, bright red cement mixer. Um, it was really animated as a kind of a robotic device because in uh, the first part of a three-part performance, it was continually spinning and its sound was um, recorded and, and amplified so that it was quite a disturbing grating uh, physical sound that was intentionally fighting for um, presence on the stage with the, 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 the text of the actors, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so the genesis of this was that um, um, Okada, who lives in the southwest of uh, Japan, some 350 kilometers from Tokyo, um, saw around his neighborhood a nearby hill, um, actually literally flattened, terraformed by earth moving equipment. And the, the earth and soil and rock that was taken from that landscape was transported to the north of Honshu, the main island of Japan, in order to place um, soil over the irradiated soil around the Fukushima nuclear disaster area. And so he was quite shocked by this, um, the implications of this kind of terraforming and this attempt to rebuild retainer walls around the sea of the, the shore of um, the, the, the north of Japan, um, presumably so that the nuclear uh, power station could be restarted and could 
presumably survive a future earthquake and cataclysmic disaster with a, um, a tidal wave and all of the story that we know that happened to the, the triple disaster in Fukushima, which was an earthquake, a tsunami or tidal wave, and uh, the rupturing and meltdown of two nuclear reactors in the Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, and this is an ongoing disaster in Japan. Um, which has led to the creation of a radiation exclusion zone around the nuclear disaster site and a lot of um, earth moving and, and construction activity to try and shore up and predict the, the future possibility of disaster. So Okada, after looking at this, announced that his new work would be based on the idea of looking at the question of whether theatre could present a world in which people and objects are completely equal, rather than trapped in their usual subservient relationship. The idea being that he felt that there was an enormous amount of hubris in the kind of human experience of simply flattening a mountain and taking that material and rebuilding it somewhere else to create retainer walls and, and, and cover over irradiated ground. There's a, a kind of human centric idea, an engineering centric idea. And I think a deeply biopolitical idea that you know, we control our environment, that we will just simply rebuild it as we see fit. And that in times of disaster, we will pretend that the disasters are not our own making, but in fact, uh, natural disasters and that um, uh, we will simply move on. Um, this performance was the context for a creation of a series of works. And so now we're talking about four works that are called the Eraser series. And that according to Tomofu Hashimoto, convey the new ties among humans. And um, I'm just reading from my screen. Um, things, space, and time, and attempt to leave anthropocentricity. Um, and these works are The Eraser Mountain, which was a theatre performance that was premiered in 2019 and is continuing to tour. Eraser Forest, which was a, a, a restaging of that live performance in a museum context in 2019. So essentially the performance was spread across a number of rooms and it was part live and part art installation. The Razor Fields, which was a streaming work that was made in 2020 and is available to be downloaded from the uh, Okada Toshiki Cheltfish website, um, uh, which is somewhat related to a Razor Mountain, but uh, is very much a, a work that focuses on domestic spaces during the time of COVID. And then as I was preparing for this talk, I came across references to a, a novelization of the work, which to be frank, I actually don't know much about and I've been trying to track down. It's a very new concept that, uh, that this work will be, which is essentially a work about object performance will be located in a, in a, in a novelistic format, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, so I'm going to read this work in relation to a text by Sabu Koso. Uh, the text is called Radiation and Revolution, in which he talks about the twin uh, impetuses of the Fukushima disaster. On the one hand, he talks about the rise of citizen protest movements and activism, uh, ecologically uh, motivated activism that arose after the Fukushima disaster, where there was a complete uh, loss of trust with the, the, the information that was being given by the government and by the scientists and um, people started citizens movements to record their own um, records of radiation levels and so on and so forth. And they also went to Tokyo and made a series of protests over about four to five years. Um, citizens protests, young people's protests, farmers protests, there were all sorts of activism. And he documents some of this. He's a um, he's a public intellectual who has uh, always been connected to the idea of activism going back to the late 1960s, early 1970s, where he was a young activist in the student protest movement. And he compares this idea of revolution with the concept of radiation. And um, these are the kind of twin dialectics in the book. And very dystopianly, he says in the book that Fukushima has become a big laboratory for testing the endurance of individuals and communities to radio radioactive contamination. Uh, 
given the idea uh, of, so the idea of laboratory is, is in the title of my paper. Orcutter's theatre is an experimental laboratory rubbing against the insidious social laboratory of the nuclear industry and these agencies of capitalism, globality in Japan in the last two decades. And so I come back to this question of what are the autonomous objects doing? What are they um, signaling in the performance and how can we think about them as um, you know, expressions of a new kind of political thought uh, in relation to Japan and um, Here's just a very brief um, excerpt from some of the scenes from, it's from Eraser Forest, but essentially this is what we saw when we also saw the Eraser Mountain live performance. And I've turned the sound down because uh, really all you hear is the grating of the, um, of the um, uh, cement mixer that is constantly going over and over and over. It's very disturbing. Um, the things that I want you to notice here are the fact that most of the actors are being remediated onto various screens and, uh, you know, very flat. And the performance is a very anti-dramatic performance. They're simply spending a lot of time moving objects around. Um, here's a screen image from Eraser Fields. And as I mentioned, the focus here is not so much uh, Kaneuji's forest of objects as a sculptural form, but simply people's domestic spaces and everyday really banal things in the time of COVID when people are locked into their apartments like everybody in the world. Um, but here there's a conspicuous focus on objects again. There are people who appear in these, um, in, in the Eraser Fields series of works, but very often they're um, obliquely placed in the space. So as we can see the legs of this person simply just walking across the space, or um, they're very banal and flat and two dimensional. And very often we're simply watching a domestic space work. We're sometimes watching a kettle boil or a machine, uh, washing machine complete its um, um, cycle. Uh, and so there is this very conscious super kind of uh, distribution of the, of the human into a kind of objectification. So the idea that I'm exploring in this work today is the concept of half transparent. In Japanese it's ham tome. And it was very much came out of the artist talk where Okada said that he didn't want to let his actors perform for the audience. He wanted to make them look away from the audience while saying the lines and perform not to the audience, but look upwards when performing. And this, he uh, directed his, his actors to be half transparent. In other words, he's taking actors into a realm where they're losing their human subjectivity, they're losing their sense of agency, and they're becoming much more object-like, or, or to, you know, they're, they're becoming equally placed within the space amidst this field of objects. Kaneyuji said the objects were placed in order to become estranged from their original purpose and to make sure that they didn't find themselves in a new story. He wanted them to appear as a piece of the vast wilderness. And the story itself is a very anti-dramatic story, and I'm going to come back to the text of that in a minute. But simply, well, for two hours, we're watching a series of objects being distributed around the stage, including those half transparent humans. Um, they both said that they were motivated to approach this idea from the work of the photographer Kawashima Kotori, who in the, um, um, uh, about a decade ago, um, had a, a, a best-selling photo book. In Japan, it's very common when you go to art bookshops to have very elaborate and very expensive photo books. And so uh, many of the art photographers in Japan, it's part of um, their, uh, um, their status is to have a significant photo book. And, and um, um, Kawashima's book was really a series of photographs of his children when they were growing up from a very young age. And as you can see with this image from, that was from um, one of the most popular images of the book that became a bestseller among people in Japan, um, these are quite disturbing images. They're um, quite hyper-realistic perhaps. They're images where the framing is very disturbed, where the children are presented in a somewhat 
kind of post-human or cyborg or perhaps um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure people will have their own responses to these works. But, you know, there's this concept, context of these images being uncanny. And here I'm going back to the root of the German unheimlich to be kind of unhomely. Um, so there is this psychic disturbance, but there's also this distanciation, this removal of the, of the human from the, the sense of being human. And um, in fact, um, they, talk, they talked about the, the photos of Ka, uh, Kawashima as being uh, idol photography. And the, the word idol in Japan, idoru, is, um, uh, relates to uh, figures that are television talents or influencers or, you know, but it also refers to the idea of a kind of hero shot, you know, a kind of uh, a, a, an iconic paradigmatic kind of focus on a particular image. And I think we can compare this to the early 20th century theory of the superflat by the visual artist Murakami Takashi, um, where he argued through his elaborate artworks and also through a manifesto that uh, all Japanese art was two dimensional. And of course, it is hyper real, it's kawaii, and it really gives us this sense of what um, uh, you know, the theorists have called kodomo shintai or the infantile child body-like interest in uh, art in Japan. So in responding to Mirai-chan's photo book, I think what we're getting in this is a very strong sense, not of a kind of cuteness, but a sense of distance, a sense of profound uh, uncanniness and distance. And so in order to develop the work, Kaneuji, who's a sculptor, was working with the actors and he basically told them to turn themselves into objects. And, um, and so the, in a series of workshops, actors would work with other actors where they would transmit the idea of objectness in order to, prom to develop a, a technique of acting, which moved away from the human-centered or subjective or even agent agentile version of a, of a human actor and really attempted to lose their sense of presence and cre create a sense of them being literally half transparent. Okada said, if I told them to be flat, they wouldn't understand it. But what he told them to be was semi-transparent. And the aim was to uh, what they called to, to create a situation where there was an extraction or removal from the anthropocentric um, understanding of, of, of the human in live performance. This was coupled with this remediation of the human bodies in, 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 a, in a style of theatre that Okada is called Ezo theatre. Ezo is a word for broadcast or for um, uh, media, mediatized images in Japan. And so theatre using projected images of performers and attempt to transform an exhibition space into a theatrical space. Um, in Azor theatre, one fiction presents another as a phenomena. And so um, this combination of the half transparent and the Azor theatre um, created a very disturbing and very flat uh, two-dimensional experience of a performance. The experience of watching the live theatre event, uh, a two-hour performance in three parts, uh, where there is no sense of communication between what's going on in the stage and the audience. The actors conspicuously deliver their lines upstage, facing away from the audience. Very often, uh, they're difficult to hear, they're, mic they're mic'd, but they're mumbling, they're speaking very quietly. And there are one or two breakout moments, which I'll discuss in a minute. But essentially, over the three sections of the performance, there's a move towards the disappearance of the human completely and an attempt to realize a performance without human bodies. Um, and in the first part of the performance, um, we have a series of conversations between uh, these disparate groups of people um, on stage who are essentially talking about their, their love of machinery and their relationship to machinery and the fact that machinery breaks down. There's a conversation between a woman and a, an owner of a white goods shop, a washing machine shop, 
And she says that, you know, she wants to get her washing machine fixed. And he says, well, we don't really fix things anymore. You know, we just replace them. And she says, oh, well, you know, um, actually, I, I really have a, I really like my machine. I, I can't really just replace it so easily. And there's this very interesting kind of, kind of quite sexualized understanding of a, of a kind of relationship to a machine. Um, where the machine stands in for any possibility of a human relationship. Um, you know, the, the girl says, I just, uh, I threw the, the, the washing into this guy, the machine. I pressed the start button. The guy would start spinning around. The laundry I received, the guy would feel damp to touch. And I also didn't know when I started calling this guy, this guy started humanizing the kind of anthropomorphic uh, uh, understanding of the machine. Um, in the second part of the performance, there's a series of um, kind of moves away from the um, 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 uh, human-centered discussion, and there's a discussion of the, the loss of people's lives. We're going into the revolutionary moment of, of radiation and revolution. And there's a speech from uh, a figure who says that... Um, you know, essentially, we've forgotten the ordinary people. It's the most political speech in, in the performance. Um, the uh, people have been forgotten. You know, the, the government is ignoring us and so on and so on. And then this concludes in the third section where there is this um, series of texts. The humans have disappeared. The objects are on the stage. And a series of texts just start to meditate on the fact that imagine there is no human anymore. Um, from the distant thunder, there were no listeners. For the changes to topography, there was no audience. And the phrase, there was no audience, is quietly repeated over and over and over. And what we're watching over two hours is this very, very anti-dramatic, very slow object performance, which I think is pointing to the kind of questions that, you, that Okada is asking about the, the dehumanization of the kind of post-human, the, the post-Fukushima environment. Um, as Okada said in uh, a talk, he said, the locality of theater has been stolen from us as a result of the shock and unease I felt in Ritsuten Kanaka, which is the area around the Fukushima disaster where they're building, where they've taken, where they've taken the erased mountain, um, has finally been able to take on an intangible shape for me, especially essentially an expression of my speechlessness in the face of an event that bears absolutely no relationship to anything capable of measurement in human terms. So to conclude, I think what we're going to, to hear is, is a sense by which we're talking about an, uh, a kind of post-anthropocenic situation, not in, in kind of more um, political terms, perhaps, in, in relation to the question of the disappearance of the human. Um, it's often not talked about in discussions of and, um, cyborg discourse and, and robot human interactions, um, the kind of ethics of the disappearance of the human. And yet that is, you know, according to people like Okada and to Sabu Koso, that is exactly what is happening. We're coming back to this big laboratory where uh, kind of a certain kind of necro-capitalism is at work um, that... Uh, places us in this laboratory of, of dystopic uh, climate uh, destroying objects. So thank you very okay. much for your time. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very involved in this issue of art in the event. So thank you very much for your interesting talk. And after reading your abstract, um, uh, you know that I had the book. Anna Maria, you're, you're oh, sorry, muted. Sorry. Uh, um, can you hear me? No. I think it's a problem with Peter. We, I can hear you perfectly. Uh, Maybe you muted your still audio, muted. Peter. No? <laughs> Sorry, I said that oh, yeah. after reading your abstract, uh, I've booked uh, for the, for the ah. show in Vienna. Sorry, but I have activated my, yes. my microphone. microphone. Can you hear me? I write to Peter. I think everybody else can hear you. I hope he can see my messages. Ah, okay. It, it, it's a problem only for, for Peter, not for the ad. So, um, uh, yeah. no, can you hear me? no. 
Uh, no, I can, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Also, because after reading your abstract, I've booked the ticket for the show in Vienna next November. I'm very curious to see directly the show about you, you, you have spoken uh, before. So um, thank you very much. And I ask it to everybody if uh, they have some, and some question. I just have a small question to Azo Theater. Is that a, a real term? Or is it just invented by the the actor, the, the director? Uh, it's invented. It? It's invented by Okada. It's so just an expression. Okay. Yeah. It's not an official term of theater making. In Japan. Not at all. But he is using the term quite a lot, so he's trying to make it an official term. I think. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. I have a short question. So, uh, a question. Uh, you you mentioned about uh, Fukushima. So I want to ask you uh, if um, there were any connection with uh, another activist artist like uh, Trevor Peglin, uh, and uh, with the project uh, "Don't Follow the Wind," Peglin created. The, uh, artwork named uh, Trinity Cube, a public radioactive sculpture made from material from Fukushima exclusion zone. Mm. I wonder if you uh, have a, a notice about this project connected to uh, Fukushima disaster. Uh, uh, um, Trevor uh, Pegler is an artiv uh, activist, yeah, yeah. Uh, artist. Uh, I'm I wondering, exactly I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar exactly with that, um, uh, that project, but I'm wondering whether it's part, I'm pretty sure it's part of a larger project that was, I could be wrong here, but there is a project that was um, curated by uh, Chimpom, um, oh. a Japanese arts collective, where they invited 10 artists from around the world and quite big names like Ai Weiwei and so on, okay. to each place an artwork within the Fukushima exclusion zone. Um, and the, the irony is that you, you know, when you put on a hazmat suit, you can go in and install the artwork, but humans can't see these artworks for 10,000 years. That's the, that's the kind of shtick of the, it's very didactic, I think, in a certain kind of way. Um, but there are 10 artworks placed in the exclusion zone that um, have been commissioned by Chimpon. Okay. And I think it might be actually one of those, but I could be completely wrong there. So please don't quote me. Okay. Yeah. I'll inform you about my impression yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the show. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have, I have a question again, as another clarification. So the, the performance you showed was for me a surprisingly a very classical setup of a stage, confrontal stage where um, the actors were actually replaced in a way, or just playing uh, transparent, or maybe uh, their gaze and their focus was different. But actually, the the audience was sitting on you one side as a normal yeah. frontal yeah. stage. Why, why didn't they ask this 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 setting actually just to erase the, the central fo focus point for classical theater? Maybe that's a good question, and I I I'd have to ask Okada, but in the um, mountain version there is a conventional front on staging of the work which one could say lends very well to the distribution of the objects because you've got a very works very well with the wide proscenium stage and um but in the kanazawa um uh, contemporary art museum the, the the theater was distributed among a number of different rooms and it you could view that work as an art installation and at various times there would be live components. So in, in the forest version, they did break down that kind of, um, kind of um, direct the, uh, proscenium based um, theatricality that you, you talk about. And then I think as they move into the mediatization, they, they, they kind of move further away from the, the kind of stage environment. Um, yeah, but they could, I mean, the work could be staged in other, kind of ways but I think it's it is partly the impact of the arrangement of uh, you know hundreds of objects on the stage that is that is so impressive and just one thing just came in mind when you show the images of the second stage where they have projected um, actors instead of real actors so I think then you really have no notion of, of uh, uh, attracting the gaze away from the audience because there are no actors anymore there so why is this instruction still valid for him? 
Yeah, I, I might have created a wrong impression in the sense that the actors are there. They're on the stage, um, usually half lit facing upstage, and they're being filmed and their image is being projected onto those surfaces. I was live projected. Yeah. Live projected. Um, yeah. Okay. So it's live projected, exactly. So they're still doing their performance, but it's being remediated onto the, the surfaces. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, so at this moment we can uh, we can go again to the symposium room. So maybe we have the link directly to the chat. Please, uh, Manuel, uh, write uh, directly for uh, into the chat. And uh, again, thank uh, uh, to Peter Eckersall and uh, to Julie Michelle Moran. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank In you. theater, we use to applaud better. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks to you. Does it work? No. But maybe now. Yes. Perfect. <laughs>